On June 18, 1967, Dan Gurney drove to victory in the Formula One Belgian Grand Prix at Spa-Francorchamps, driving a Gurney Westlake-powered Eagle chassis designed and built in the United States. It marked the first and only time an American has stood atop a world championship podium as both a winning driver and constructor. Welcome to a celebration of that historic victory, focusing on the winning machine. This is 1967 Spa, the All-American Victory. Hello everyone, I'm Bob Varsha. In 1921, a 27-year-old racing driver from California by the name of Jimmy Murphy won the French Grand Prix at Le Mans driving an American-built Duesenberg. 46 years later, another California driver, Dan Gurney, went Murphy won better, winning the Belgian Grand Prix in a car that was not only American-built, but created by Gurney's own company, All American Racers. Now, as you might guess from that name, Gurney is proud of his American roots, so he called his race car the Eagle. Today, that car resides in a place of honor in a Florida museum, and that's where my speed colleagues David Hobbs and Steve Matchett went to profile this unique piece of racing history. Hi, everybody. Today, Steve and I are in Naples, Florida at the Collier Collection, which also houses the Revs Institute for Automotive Research, an absolutely fantastic collection here in Naples. But today, Steve, you and I are going to look at another very special guest here. We are indeed, and here is that very special guest. It is the Eagle Westlake car, chassis number 104, that was designed and built by Dan Gurney, but not only that, he took this car to the race win at the 1967 Belgian Grand Prix at Spa. It is an absolutely phenomenal machine, magnificent in many ways, David, and we're going to have a very close look at it. We'll get to that in a moment. In almost a half century since the first Eagle, all American racers have turned out more than 150 significant racing cars. Now in his 80s, Dan Gurney and his team, some of whom have been with him from the beginning, are still adding to their company's list of achievements. Sam Posey offers a perspective on the living legacy of Dan Gurney. When he was a boy, Dan Gurney saw a tomato plant that had grown up through the asphalt and against all odds, blossomed. It could be the story of Dan's career. As a driver, a car builder, and a car owner, he has never had it easy. Yet, he has always found a way to win. He brought Porsche and Brabham their first championship victories. He won Le Mans for Ford with A.J. Foyt, and he won in USAC, NASCAR, and the Can-Am. He built cars that won Indy. He built the revolutionary Delta Wing and ran it at Le Mans. He broke into Formula One in 1959, when it was at its most dangerous. His team, Ferrari, had lost both their lead drivers. A seat was open. Dan took it and finished second in his second GP on the deadly high banks of the Ottos. He left Ferrari because he disliked the politics. Over the next six years, he established a reputation as one of the best in the business. In fact, the great Jim Clark said Dan was the only driver he really feared. Dan was essentially a hired gun, but he had a keen interest in the way cars were designed and built. In the mid-1960s, Goodyear was just getting into big-time racing, and to win, they had to beat Firestone. They suffered an acute embarrassment in 1964 at Indy when on the eve of the race, the Goodyear teams all switched to Firestone. That left Goodyear looking for racers that would be loyal to their brand. And Carroll Shelby brokered a deal that made him partners with Dan in a Goodyear-backed team. Its primary target was Indy, but Formula One rules were nearly identical in those days and Dan was able to negotiate the financing to go Grand Prix racing as well. The tomato plant was about to thrust through the asphalt. In a moment, we'll revisit that historic 67 Belgian Grand Prix, including some of Dan's memories of the day. And we'll begin our close-up look at the Eagle Westlake that wrote racing history, starting with its most distinctive feature. In 1967, Dan Gurney enjoyed one of his most successful racing seasons, but the month of June was special. On the 11th, he and A.J. Foyt won the 24 Hours of Le Mans by more than 30 miles. And just a week later, Gurney and his team unloaded their newest Eagle, chassis 104, at the Belgian Grand Prix. Round four of the 67 Formula One season took place on the fast and dangerous old eight and three-quarter mile Spa-Francorchamps circuit. 
Eagle 104, built using lightweight titanium to reach the minimum weight limit, split the Lotus Fords of Jimmy Clark and Graham Hill on the front row in qualifying. In those days, the grid lined up at Spa beyond the hairpin at La Source on the downhill run to Eau Rouge. I got a lousy start because we tried to, uh, it's, it's a little bit of downhill at the at Spa uh, in front of the start finish line. And we put a rag under the tire to stop the car from rolling. Well, it wasn't big enough rag and it started to roll. I had to take my foot off and get on the brake and uh, they dropped the flag at that same time. So I missed the start. By the time the field had plunged through Eau Rouge and up the Kemmel straightaway, the Eagle lay sixth. Gurney went on the attack and eventually passed Jackie Stewart for second. When the dominant Clark pitted with fouled spark plugs, Gurney found himself locked in a fight with Stewart for victory and dealing with an engine miss. In the cockpit, I could see him coming. I leaned on, the, I leaned forward and I stepped up and I, I kind of went like this. That's it, you know, pretending, uh, you know, to uh, tell him to uh, come through. And uh, and then I'm sitting behind him and I thought, well, you know, that, I don't want to finish second here. What difference does it make? Uh, so I thought I might as well gas it, missing or not. And then I noticed he had a little spiral of uh, maybe oil coming out of his gearbox. And I thought, oh, hey, that looks promising. <laughs> Despite the engine miss and low fuel pressure, Gurney got by the struggling Stewart en route to winning the fastest Grand Prix ever to that point, averaging 145.988 miles per hour. More importantly, Gurney and his All-American Racers crew had achieved their goal to win a Formula One Grand Prix with an American driver in a car of their own construction. Flying in those days seemed to be a little more chancy than it is today. And I used to say, oh, well, I hope this thing doesn't go down because I haven't won a Grand Prix in the Eagle yet. And uh, so following the win at Spa, why uh, I got in an airplane and I said, uh, Okay, if you go down now, that's all right. It doesn't make a difference to me because I'm already in this history books. And uh, so emotionally, it was a huge, uh, big catch for me and uh, for our whole team. Now that we know more about the man and how he took his machine to victory, let's begin our close-up look at chassis 104, known as the titanium car, beautifully maintained by the experts at the Revs Institute. Here's Steve Matchett. What we're looking at here is a very iconic Formula One chassis, chassis number 104 of the all-American racers Eagle Wesleyan. Much of the monocoque of the car is made out of magnesium, fabricated and riveted together. The section of chassis 104 from here, the very tip of the Eagle's nose, to just back here, the start of the monocoque itself, is actually not made of magnesium fabrication. It is made out of a composite material, basically a fiberglass. As we look a bit further back, we can see there are some black shark gill designs, and we see actually now in contemporary Formula One design in 2012, but they were still using it back then in 1967. So let's remove the bodywork now and see what's hidden underneath. And look at this, the difference is absolutely night and day. Now you can see the reason for the aerodynamic profile bodywork that covers this section of the car. Once that is stripped away, we can see all of the componentry hidden underneath. We were talking about the airflow coming in through the eagle-shaped nose on the fiberglass bodywork to call this the heater matrix here, the radiator for the engine mounted in the back of the car. But behind that, as we come a little bit further back, Look at all this, again, absolutely magnificent fabrication of all the components. As we move back here to the three master cylinders here, the clutch and the two brake master cylinders, all American racers, Len Terry, Dan Gurney, wanted to get the damper and the spring out of the airflow. And we can see it opened up all this area here to remove drag. Now we can show you exactly where they are. On this fabricated titanium rocker, if you look underneath here, here's our sway bar mounted left and right on the chassis. Underneath, again, left and right, you can see the damper and the coilover spring, which controls the suspension of the car. That famous Eagle's Beak nose design was a group effort among Gurney, designer Len Terry, and Dan's father, John, who was artistically talented. 
In fact, when Dan was born in 1931, his father was a regular performer with New York's Metropolitan Opera. We'll return with 1967 Spa, the All-American Victory. Welcome back to All-American Victory. Once Dan Gurney had established his new company, All-American Racers, in partnership with Carroll Shelby, a staff was needed to design and build the IndyCar financial backer Goodyear wanted, as well as the Formula One car that Dan dreamed of. So he opened his address book, compiled over eight seasons of international racing. Let's rejoin David Hobbs and Steve Matchett. Dan Gurney arrived in Europe in the early 1960s to do Formula One, and of course while he was there he met Colin Chapman of Lotus fame, and of course Colin was regarded as one of the most avant-garde designers of the time, but one of the guys that worked for him was also a very good designer by the name of Len Terry. So after Clark and Lotus had won the Indy 500 in 1965 and Dan Gurney decided to form uh, All-American Racers and build his own car, he got Len Terry to come over from Lotus and work for him on the design of this car. Now most cars up till then had, had a bottom and a top wishbone for the front suspension, yeah, like they had for the rear. Uh, but Len had gone off on a slightly different tack, and he had a very wide-based uh, bottom A-arm here, the, the wide uh, rear bar there taking care of the braking loads when, when the car wanted to twist. And instead of having a top A-arm, he had this uh, link. And the thing about this top link was that he could put the spring and the damper in here, inboard, out of the airstream, so the car was much more aerodynamic, or slippery, anyway, through the air. Uh, he had them cooled, there was enough air going around to cool them. Uh, easy to adjust with the roll bar that Steve has pointed out earlier on was in there. So everything is shrouded from the wind and it made a much more aerodynamic package and they work very well. All the handling in the cars was just the suspension, no aerodynamic help at all. These cars, of course, had a ground clearance of probably three or four inches depending how bumpy the track was and how much undulation there was and how much down compression load you get. And so the vertical motion on these wheels was really enormous compared to modern cars. A lot went through these suspensions, and people like Len Terry were masters of their craft. So let's turn our attention to the power production half of the car, the rear end. Now, to expose the engine and see it in this wonderful detail, we've removed the two panels away from here that would have given a little bit more aerodynamic efficiency to the design. The power plant itself is the Gurney Westlake 3-litre V12, and it's mounted to the back face of the monocoque. So we are in a semi-stressed state, and let me explain how that works. Just like a fully stressed engine, the engine mountings are bolted onto the back face of the monocoque. But come further back here, and we can see this fabulous hand-fabricated titanium beam, which is bonded through bolt holes onto the rear of the monocoque, underneath here where the fuel tanks are. So from there, we bolt the transmission and the rear of the engine and all the suspension onto that beam. So it isn't fully stressed, it's semi-stressed. Now, if the Gurney Westlake engine had a weakness, it was in its oil scavenge system. It's a dry sump system. The oil tank is stored at the front of the car, and the oil is then transmitted back through pipes and pumps to the engine itself. But because of the length of the V12, it didn't really scavenge and clean out that oil as well as it could, and that led to reliability problems. Now, let's have a look at just one final piece of beautiful fabrication. Again, it is in titanium. It is these wonderful exhaust systems. There isn't a single weld on these pipes, and this is the absolutely fantastic bit for me. Not one of these pipes touches another. There is an air gap between all of them. They flow down three into one, three into one each side, so you end up with four tailpipes. And look at the beautiful coloration of the titanium caused by the exhaust temperature. Absolutely fabulous. The Gurney Westlake V12 was designed by Aubrey Woods, whom Dan had worked with at BRM. And those magnificent titanium exhausts were the work of fabricator Pete Wilkins, one of several members of the Eagle crew who followed Dan back to America when the Formula One project ended. We'll be back in a moment. The four Eagle Formula One chassis from All American Racers each represented an evolutionary step in the effort by Dan Gurney and his team to make the car lighter and faster. Drawing on their Southern California locations, surrounded by hot rodders and the booming aviation industry, they experimented with materials while retaining a number of traditional design features. Once again, here's Steve Matchett and David Hobbs. So now let's turn our attention to the center section of the Eagle Westlake from 1967. 
the item known as the monocoque, the fundamental building block of all Formula One cars, contemporary equipment and cars back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Now, as we got into the 1960s, and certainly for 1967, the All-American racers decided to use magnesium because it's incredibly light. They did away with all the tubing, and the monocoque itself was just made by sheets of magnesium, formed into shape, and then riveted together. Now, you notice if you look at this chassis, 104, there are thousands of rivets all over this bodywork. The reason for that is magnesium is a very difficult material to bend. It doesn't yield or ply very easy, so to stop it from cracking and fracturing when the guys were putting it together, they had to increase dramatically the number of rivets. However, the end result is a monocoque that is both incredibly strong and also incredibly light. Weight in Formula One is everything. This car is very lightweight, that's a huge advantage. Now, on the downside of the design for the driver's safety, poor old Dan Gurney had to sit right in here, of course. But what you may not know is the fuel tanks of the Eagle Westlake were each side of the car from here all the way back underneath the titanium exhaust systems, 25 gallons on each side. Poor old Dan had to drive around Spa with 50 gallons of racing fuel on each side of him. Well, we replaced the steering wheel, a very familiar sight in today's modern racing, but of course, when this car was built, in fact, this steering wheel was not removable. The driver had to slide in underneath it. And of course, the other thing, I'm sliding into not just any old race car, I'm sliding into the car that won the 1967 Belgian Grand Prix at an average speed of 145 miles an hour with Dan Gurney sitting in this very seat. So, very, very cool. The only uncool thing, as Steve pointed out, is that also you're sitting here in the middle of 50 gallons of fuel. It gets fed into the car through these two points on the front here. This is the fuel uh, vent bleed, which comes out just behind the driver's head, attached to this massively effective rollover bar, which in fact is bolted onto the monocoque in a very small bracket with a couple of very minute bolts, so it's about as much use as well. Whatever, not very really useful at all. The dashboard in here, incredibly simple layout. On the left here, we have the uh, water temperature and uh, pressure. On the right, oil temperature and pressure. In the middle, the rev counter, going up to 12,000 RPM. To the bottom is the fuel pressure. On and off switch, fuel pump, electric fuel pump switch, fire extinguisher button, that didn't do much good either. Electric starter, five-speed gear shift, obviously manually operated by the driver. Mirrors, no wings to see in the way, so very uh, good visibility out the back. But what a car and how cool it is to sit in this car, this very same car that won that historic Grand Prix victory so many years ago. Now that we've seen the spa-winning eagle up close, it's time for a moment we know you've been waiting for. After the break, we'll fire up the Gurney Westlake V12, and our David Hobbs gets a big surprise. Stay with us. Welcome back to our close-up look at Dan Gurney's Grand Prix winning Eagle West Lake Formula One car. Now, here's where our story went off plan. David Hobbs and Steve Matchett were about to leave the Revs Institute when the staff presented them with the proverbial offer they couldn't refuse. Well, it was a very interesting day that we had down there and we'd, Steve and I had done all our various stand-ups and shoots and, and then the guy uh, with the car said, do you want to hear it run? So we thought, oh, well, that That'd be pretty neat, yeah, absolutely. We will do, yes. Of course, yeah, we would, I'd love to. I mean, as a mechanic, there's no question I was dying to hear this engine fire up. I'd never, I'd never heard a, a Westlake engine V12 fire up before. There was a few burps and rough starts at first. That's perfectly normal with one of those early uh, V12 engines. And I said to Steve, if the thing starts, it'll be a miracle. But, hey presto, third go, boom, off it went. Uh, much to my absolute astonishment, somebody said to me, well, do you, me, want to drive it? And I said, me? Then, out of the corner of my eye, as I'm watching the engineers and mechanics working on the car, I see David Hobbs start to take his shoes off. Well, I had some fairly big shoes on, uh, which I didn't think would be a very good idea to get down to the foot box where the pedals are, in case they got jammed on the, on the side of the, of the monocoque down there. So I took my shoes off. Being a a front-end mechanic, as my position was back with Benetton, as soon as the driver got anywhere near the car, it was my job to help the driver in. And obviously, it was almost instinctive. I couldn't resist walking forward and trying helping David, our driver, get inside the car. And off we go.
I gave it a bit of welly once down that straight, but of course I didn't want to get too much throttle in case the thing got stuck or something, uh, where there'd be absolutely no room to react, uh, no time to react at all. I'd, I'd have been out in the street in the car park of the building next door if, I, if the throttle had stuck. <laughs> Bloody hell, what fun that was, lad. <laughs> Actually had a bit of wheel spin over the back there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about tyre pressures for the next stop. Well, the tyre pressures, I think I want to be just a little bit down on the right front, about half <laughs> bare side of the right front. And maybe the left rear, about a quarter of a pound up, I think. <laughs> Now, I was thrilled to be there as a mechanic, but for David, a driver, to get in the car that he was very familiar with and to do a few exploratory laps outside the Collier collection around the parking lot, well, he was absolutely thrilled by it, and it was a memory that'll stay with me forever. As I slid in there, it was just like I'd never stopped sliding into cars, which, you know, I did for 30-odd years, and, um, boy, it brought back some incredible memories as I, as I slid down to that monocoque, and there I was. I felt very proud and honoured to be able to drive such a historic car. I mean, it, it was a great opportunity, and I certainly couldn't turn it down. The Eagle Formula One project lasted barely three seasons, and though Belgium would be the only point-scoring victory for the car, that takes nothing away from its place in history. We're grateful to the Revs Institute for taking such great care of the spa-winning Eagle Westlake and for allowing us access to it. And, of course, thanks also to Dan Gurney and All-American Racers for creating one of the most beautiful race cars ever and giving us an inspiring story of success against all odds. For David Hobbs and Steve Matchett, I'm Bob Varsha. Thanks for watching.